the background that I want to offer before we get started is that um, the journeys that we take are very different, um, and the folks we touch in those different places are also very different. Um, so I'm excited, actually, to be here and to see folks who I've worked with over my 36-year tenure in very different places. Um, students, um, faculty, and administrators who I've had the opportunity to be um, colleagues and friends with. So I'm excited that you're here, and I'm excited to be here, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny. I'm the other person. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions as we go along. We may even answer them. The presentation we're going to give, we're going to try to get through a lot of stuff very quickly today. The presentation, when I get, when I get back home and get a little bit of sleep, will be on the website there. So feel free just to write that down and not have to take notes. You can take notes if you want to, though. So I'm going to start by talking about, about research, ours and other people's. All the photos that you'll see are people that were a part of our study. Our study was the first large-scale study that looked at the wide range of transgender identities, and really post-transgender identities, as some people in the study no longer identified as being transgender. And it's the largest study done yet to look at transgender identity development. So the book chapters, just quickly, we looked at demographics, the experiences of transgender identity, the climate, development milestones for different transgender groups, which we'll talk about a little bit today, and then implications for higher education. We had close to 3,500 people take part in an online survey. You can see here some of the demographic information from the research. About three quarters were assigned male at birth, which in doing this kind of research is not uncommon to have that high a number. Trans women are much more visible online and are more likely to be part of support groups, which we went to a lot of support groups to get support, I guess you might say, for our, for our research. You see there are some of the age and race demographics. Because the study was so large, we have a great deal of information even on small segments of, of people who are in the study. And then we did follow-up interviews. We could have done thousands of follow-up interviews if, if we had, had wanted to. We had to shut it down at, at a certain point because it just was overwhelming the number of people who wanted to share with us their stories. But we have hundreds of interviews that we did that, that add to the richness of the, of the research. So looking at the different milestones that, that cut across different groups, whether individuals were female to male, male to female, cross-dressing individuals, people who did drag, people who identified as being genderqueer or other non-binary gender identities. We came up with these <clears throat> milestones. Feeling gender different from a young age and seeking to express this difference through how they dressed and acted. Repressing or hiding these feelings in the face of hostility or isolation. Recognizing that, that indeed there are transgender people, hello. Getting to know and know other transgender people. Deciding on what identity best fits, overcoming denial and internalized genderism to accept oneself, having a presentation that matches one's identity, deciding whether or when to tell others and developing new relationships as a result of that, and then developing a sense of wholeness within a society that does not validate your identity. So those are some of the commonalities, but they didn't work or didn't work very well for a lot of the younger people in our study who had very different experiences. We <clears throat> found that on average people began to recognize themselves as being gender different about the age of four or five years old. For most people in the study, they did not have any support around that and had no resources. We had a lot of people who did not have any understanding of who they were until much later in life, until this thing called the internet came along. And then go online, oh my, oh my God, there are other people like myself out there. Very different for people today, whether 
is such a thing as internet and go online at, at, at that four and five years old or maybe a bit later than that and discover a whole world out there of people just like themselves and could talk to those people. So younger people had much greater understanding of who they were at a young age. And also were more likely to have support if they were male assigned individuals. There's, there's always been some space for female assigned individuals who want to be masculine in their presentation and their behavior. It could be tomboys, which may not be the most comfortable thing, but it is a cultural space that's there, at least until adolescence. There's no such space for individuals assigned male who want to be female or feel themselves to be female. None whatsoever. So for a lot of the male assigned individuals, there's a great deal of repression that went on. We heard such horrific stories of people who went through decades and decades of not being able to be themselves and finally faced who they were later in life. Very different for the younger people who now there are some parents who are, who are supportive. So there's less likely for a sense of being in denial, being confused. One of the things that was really interesting to look at was just when people began to know other people like themselves. For the younger people, two thirds indicated that they knew somebody who identified like themselves before they identified that way. It was just the opposite for the older people, where two thirds did not know anyone like themselves before they claimed that label. Very different experience. Less likely to misidentify at all or for very long. Most of the trans women, transsexual women in the study, identified first as cross-dressers. Seemed to fit, right? Feel like I want to dress female, must be a cross-dresser. Wasn't until later on that many realized that it was more than that. They wanted, they, they were women. For about three quarters of the individuals who were female assigned, who were attracted to women, identified first as lesbians. Again, made sense. Wasn't until later on that they realized that that didn't fit either. For the younger people, there's less likely to have that misidentification taking place or for very long. And then they come to college expecting to have support and resources, which often, unfortunately, they don't find. Recognize that there's not one way to be transgender. Back in the day, back in, in my day, you, you basically were faced with a choice when you came out, you're either going to be TS or CD, transsexual or cross-dresser. And if you're, the dividing point was whether you're going to have surgery or not. So when, for example, when I came out and identified as being somewhere in the middle, the least support that I received was from other transgender people who were primarily transsexual women who were a bit older than myself, who couldn't get me because I wasn't interested in hormones or surgery, but yet I identified as female. They, they could not get that. So it was, ironically, I had more support from non-transgender, from cisgender people in my life who was supporting me as transgender than from other transgender people. They eventually got it, you know, years later, you know, I started to, you know, uh, have electrolysis and change my name and say, oh, okay, you really are one of us. But it, it, it took a learning experience for them because they grew up in a very different sort of time when there wasn't, there wasn't any ambiguity, there wasn't any in-between. So may not see themselves as wanting surgeries or hormones to, to be themselves, so kind of a new definition of transsexual developing that you can be a man with a vagina and that's okay, or a woman with a penis and that's okay. <clears throat> Refusing to accept a, giant, a gender binary and may identify outside of that binary and in very, various ways and may decide to use gender inclusive pronouns for themselves. And I like to point out that it's, it's not my preferred pronouns, it's the pronouns that I use. And then 
in looking at people who identified as, as genderqueer or as other non-binary gender identities, what we found, not surprisingly, is that these individuals were almost exclusively younger people and almost exclusively female assigned. And other research, as you can see up here, supported that as well. I sometimes joke that I am the oldest genderqueer male assigned person in captivity. <clears throat> Which, this points out the fact that there really is still not a space for individuals who are male assigned to be female feminine. That there are just, is, it's still such a stigmatized experience, unfortunately. You know, we, we've had a change, a, a, a sea change, where we have high school students, college students, who are female assigned, who are identifying as trans guys or as, in various ways, non-female. We don't have the same thing going on for male assigned individuals. They're still very often in the closet, unwilling to come out. It's still very much what it was 20 years ago and is a middle-aged phenomenon, sadly. I think within another 10 years, that will change, because you see now, among elementary school kids, among the youngest kids, a much more even divide in terms of male assigned, female assigned, identifying in various ways as trans or gender nonconforming, but there's still not a space for adults to have that experience. 